This is Canada, the second largest country in the world and one of the most interesting economies that we can research today because of the problems it is facing. On the surface, Canada might just look like any other advanced economy. It has a relatively high standard of living, high incomes, advanced industries, and an advanced financial system to keep the whole thing going. But beneath the surface, Canada is plagued with a range of macroeconomic issues that have led many economists and even the OECD to believe that it will be the worst performing advanced economy in the coming decades. Now, these are some big claims. And I have to say, as always, nobody can predict the future, least of all economists. But that doesn't mean that the concerns that these organisations have raised are not genuine. At the very least, they can teach us a lot about the challenges that we will face in our own economies because, while Canada might be the hardest hit by these issues, everybody else will by no means be immune. And yes, that includes their neighbours to the south. So, why is Canada projected to be the slowest growing advanced economy for the next five decades? Will these issues impact all of our economies? And is there anything that can be done to fix these problems before they start to seriously impact the citizens of Canada? Once we've looked at all of that, we can put Canada on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard. If you wouldn't feel comfortable walking around in public with your home address printed on your shirt, you probably shouldn't be surfing the web using your IP address because it makes you just as easy to find. That's why this episode of Economics Explained was brought to you by Private Internet Access. A VPN, or Virtual Private Network, is a clever system that lets you disguise your computer's IP address when using the internet. Private Internet Access lets you change that address to something completely different, even one in a totally different country. Private Internet Access is the most trusted VPN with 36 million satisfied customers and 4.6 stars on Trustpilot. You can easily choose from servers around the world, which beyond privacy also has some perks like watching region locked videos on YouTube and streaming services. In addition, you can use one account to protect up to 10 devices at the same time. The best part is, Private Internet Access has agreed to offer an 82% discount to viewers of this channel on top of three free months when you sign up using the link on screen now or in the video description below. Canada is both blessed and cursed by its regional position. It is blessed because of its proximity and cultural closeness to the largest economy in the world a connection which has made it the United States' largest trading partner. It has also got access to both the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean for even more international trade opportunities, all while being very protected in a nice, peaceful part of the world. Unfortunately, its position also means that most of its landmass is uninhabited tundra, and its population is highly concentrated in just a few urban centres close to the southern border, and close to that much larger and much more dominant economy. Now, geography is not the reason that Canada is in trouble, but it could make a lot of its problems worse. So remember this for later on. The real problem is that Canadians just don't make as much as their American peers. I mean this in the sense that average salaries in Canada are lower, but also the average Canadian just does not make as much stuff as the average American. Part of this gap is pretty easy to explain. Americans just work more hours than Canadians, so they have more time to produce more value for their economy. But even adjusted for working time, Americans are on average more than 30% more productive than Canadians. The average American worker produces $66 worth of value per hour, whereas the average Canadian only produces $50 worth of value per hour. So why is this? Too many of those workers' rights? Too many poutine breaks? Such a large gap is actually quite hard to explain. A lot of economists assume that this gap was caused by the different industry makeups of the US and Canada. America just has more high income industry centres that pushes the national average up. For example, there is no real Canadian equivalent of Wall Street or Silicon Valley. If this explanation was correct, it would also mean that this difference is pretty much meaningless because a few standout value adders pulling up the national average isn't really giving much insight into the experience of most participants in the economy. The OECD has since found out that even on a per industry basis, Canada still falls behind the US in terms of productivity. So the high performing industry excuse doesn't really hold up. The real reason is that the US just invests a lot more into making their workers more productive. To produce anything, we need the factors of production, land, labor, and capital. 
You can make your labour more productive by making your population younger, better educated and healthier. Land is more productive if it's close to water reserves or rich in natural materials. And capital, which is simply things like machinery or infrastructure, becomes more valuable the more that is invested into it. It's also important to consider that improving any of these factors will have positive impacts on the other two factors. For example, if a country finds a better way to manage its farmland, it can support a higher population of younger workers. If it has a bigger population, there will be more people to make more innovations to improve capital. And capital is instrumental in making land and workers more productive. An accountant with a computer running Microsoft Excel can do the work of two accountants using calculators and five accountants using their heads. A farm with modern irrigation systems, genetically enhanced crops and modern fertilisers is going to produce much more food on the same acre of land when compared to a farm without these capital advancements. Computers, calculators, fertilisers and irrigation systems are all what economists consider capital. A more simple definition is just stuff that makes stuff. Capital investments make both land and labour more efficient, and this is what Canada is lacking when compared to the United States. As of 2019, Canadian businesses spend $13,000 per worker per year on capital. Again, this could be anything from office chairs to state-of-the-art machines. The US, by contrast, spent $20,500 per worker, or 50% more than Canadian businesses did. A lot of this is down to financing infrastructure. The US is a hotbed of business investment thanks in large part to its public markets that attract both American and international investors. Canada, of course, has its own public stock exchanges, but they are not nearly as large and don't attract the same type of international investment. Obviously, this is anecdotal, but I personally, as an individual investor, have roughly one third of my total portfolio invested into US companies, despite living in Australia, because the US is just a logical place to invest. It uses the world's reserve currency, it has a very favourable business environment, and it's just so large that it becomes the default choice. This has trickle-down consequences for even non-publicly traded companies in the country. For example, take Bob and Marshall here. Bob owns a construction company in the US and Marshall owns a construction company in Canada. Both of these company owners want to raise a million dollars to buy a new warehouse for their equipment, so they start looking for investors. The American company is much more likely to find it because there is simply more investment capital floating around in America. An initial public offering, or IPO, is when a company's shares are first listed on a public market. A lot of the time, the money raised in these offerings is not actually going to fund anything the company does, but instead it is going to pay back early investors so that they can take their money and reinvest it into more new businesses. This happens on the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange the same as it does on the Toronto Stock Exchange. The difference is that the American markets are proportionately much larger and therefore there is more liquidity available for businesses of all sizes. Given this difference in capital investment between Canada and the US, it's actually remarkable that Canadian workers are able to produce as much as they currently are. But of course, the relationship between labour efficiency and capital intensity is not exactly linear. Eventually a worker is going to have all the tools they need to do their job and anything else is going to have diminishing returns. So why does this actually matter? Most countries in the world have less productive workers than the US. Why isn't it a problem for them? This productivity issue is such a problem for Canada really because of the silent rivalry it has with the US. For a video about the economy of Canada, I have spoken a lot about the United States and I have done this for two reasons. The first is that most of my audience is American and they tend to lose interest if they're not mentioned every few minutes. But more importantly, Canada has a true economic rivalry with the US. To be clear, Canada and the US are allies they have very open trade policies and of course they are culturally extremely close. But all of this just makes the battle for talent that much more fierce. About 45,000 Canadians move to the United States every year, but despite the constant posts on social media threatening to do as much, only around 9,000 Americans move to Canada. This is simply a decision that most make based on opportunity. We have already seen that American workers earn more on average, and this is especially true for highly skilled individuals with equally high salaries. Top income earners in Canada can make much more money by moving to the US, and they will also be paying much less tax on that income. 
Yes, social security is not as strong in America, but that doesn't matter very much to high income earners. This brain drain means that Canada consistently suffers from a talent shortage, which it has had to fill with skilled migrants. Now, skilled migration can be a great thing, but there are some side effects. Housing affordability being one of the big ones, especially in Canada. Because remember, while it's a big country, most people live in a small handful of metropolitan cities. This growth in house prices has been a problem for Canadian cities for the past two decades, but it's becoming especially apparent now. Higher land prices also further starve businesses of money that they could be investing into capital. If a business spends more money renting or buying its facilities, it's not going to have as much to spend on staff wages and the tools it needs to add value to the economy. It's also going to make it harder for those businesses to raise money because investors and banks are going to be more drawn to the real estate market rather than the business financing market. Ironically, this housing affordability issue is only exacerbating the problem of skilled Canadians looking to move out of the country to American cities where they can earn more and pay a lot less. Now it's time to put Canada on the Economics Explained national leaderboard. Canada is the eighth largest economy in the world with a GDP of $1.64 trillion. So despite all of the mean stuff I've said in this video, it's still a very heavy hitter and it gets an 8 out of 10. That strong GDP is spread out over a relatively modest population of 38 million people, giving it a GDP per capita of $43,258 and an 8 out of 10. Stability and confidence is great. Part of the reason that Canada has such expensive real estate is that wealthy people from across the world see it as a safe haven to invest their money. It has a strong and stable democratic government and an overall well-managed economy. It gets a 9 out of 10. Growth has not been strong, and according to the OECD's predictions, it's not going to improve anytime soon. Canada has really not seen any nominal GDP growth at all in the past decade, so it gets a 2 out of 10. Finally, industry. Canada does have robust service, financial, mining and agricultural industries. And while it might be overshadowed on all fronts by its big brother to the south, it's still no slouch on the world stage. It gets a 7 out of 10. Altogether, this gives Canada an average score of 6.8 out of 10, putting it here on the Economics Explained national leaderboard. This episode of Economics Explained was brought to you by Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN provider. Private Internet Access never records or stores user data. And we know this because they make all of their code completely open source, which means that people can look through it to guarantee that there is no funny business going on behind the scenes. This transparency makes sure that you aren't using a VPN designed to protect your privacy from internet service providers, network administrators and government sensors, only to have it given to the VPN company itself. So make sure you are using the world's most transparent VPN provider by signing up using the link on screen now to save 82% on your subscription on top of getting 3 months completely for free. The link is also in the video description below. Thanks for watching mate, bye.